morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The mic is working. Welcome. <laughs> and thank you for welcoming me. I just wanted to introduce myself and, and tell you a little brief, brief um, bit about me before we worship together. Uh, I'm Amy Cooley Higgs. I um, graduated in May from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. And I've um, been serving in the church for about 11 years. I've, I've worked with youth and family um, over the years and then answered a call to, to seminary. And so I am on the verge of what's next. Um, what's next for me today is I'll be leaving here and heading to camp. Um, I'm serving um, as a chaplain at Stony Lake this summer. Um, so that's my immediate next step, and then we'll see what happens after that. Um, let you a little, know a little bit about me. Um, I live in Brighton, Michigan. I worked in Ann Arbor for about 15 years. Um, I worked at Gretchen's house as a teacher and an administrator, and know Heidi and, and Tom, and I know that they weren't going to be here today, but it was it was nice to know a connection, and um, nice to be back in Ann Arbor. I've been driving to Farmington Hills for the last year and a half for my internship. <laughs> so, nice to be on familiar, familiar ground again. So I'm happy to be here with you today and lead you through worship. Uh, I just there's a, a, a couple of brief welcome messages. If you have a special prayer request, please fill out the gray paper request form and give it to an usher. And an annotated prayer list is available today from an usher and will be made available in the weekly email and monthly newsletter. And with that, let us begin worship. Thank um. be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin with the presence of God and of one another. Hmm. 
most merciful God. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead to sin and made us alive together with Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Please join in with gathering him.
opened the way for us and brought our, us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that, overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I see that there's some kids here. Would you like to come up and have some time? My kids can? We'll do the message. Come on up. I don't know how it normally works, but I like to sit on the step. Come on up if you'd like to join me. today, it talks about Jesus and Jesus having compassion. Have you ever heard the word compassion? Do you know what compassion means? We're going to talk about it, but it means feeling something deep in your gut, deep inside you, to have compassion. And it's a little bit like passion. Do you have things that you're passionate about? What kind of things are you passionate about? Chocolate chip pancakes. <laughs> Anybody else have anything they are passionate about? Do you, anything that you really, really, really care about? Do you think about that? No? No? <laughs> well, I there's lots of things I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about art. I'm passionate about helping other people about working with kids and families. But when we say compassion, the word compassion means to have passion for some, somebody else or something else. So when we hear Jesus use the word compassion, that means he was feeling something deeply for the people that he was take, trying to take care of. So we're going to listen for that word when we, when we read the gospel and when I talk in my message today. And, and think about what you might be Passion is all about having passion, having love, having concern for other people. And it's one of the things that God asks us to do. So think about how you can have your own passions that you care about and how maybe that helps you serve and care for other people and be compassionate. All right. Well, thanks for coming up. reading from Exodus. The Israelites had journeyed from refugee entered the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called him from the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 100 responsibly. <laughs> Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God, creator to whom we belong. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter the gates of the Lord with 
thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's holy name. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. 
Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Jesus sent them to continue the same ministry to a world in need. He gave them authority to cast out unclean spirits and to cure every disease and sickness, even to raise people from the dead. The disciples were to carry on Jesus' mission to his sheep, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion for the crowds. The Greek word for compassion means to be moved in your guts. Jesus was physically moved with deep compassion for the distressed people who followed him. They were like helpless sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus gathered his disciples, saying the harvest is plentiful, and asking them to pray that God would send laborers to help care for and tend his sheep. The harvest in this passage refers to missionary outreach. Up to this point, Jesus has been the sole missionary, but in chapter 10, he commissioned his disciples to become his partners in the work of preaching the gospel, teaching, and healing. They were called and equipped by the Spirit to do so. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Their mission was not one that they needed to work out on their own. Jesus gave very specific instructions on where to go and whom to visit, on what to say and what to do. Jesus was sending them like sheep into the midst of wolves, out into a world that resisted what God had to offer. They would be handed over to councils, flogged in synagogues, dragged before governors and kings, families would be divided, and stigmas born because of Jesus' name. No one ever said being a disciple was easy. However, in the, midst, the very midst of persecution, those obedient to Jesus' mission were equipped and empowered with God's own presence. I am with you always even to the end of the age. Jesus was in the midst of training disciples for mission. For the past two weeks, I've been a part of staff training at camp, preparing the young adults who will serve as camp counselors to guide and care for the campers that will attend Stony Lake beginning today. We too have been training disciples for mission bringing together all God's children to experience Christian community, to grow in faith, develop leadership skills, and serve others. It's a lofty endeavor to authentically create space for all God's children. But in the midst of it, as CJ, the executive director, says, we find ourselves glimpsing 
the reign of God on earth as it is in heaven. I've also been spending the last four years training in seminary to be prepared for service and mission in the world. Ready to say, here I am, just as the disciples were maybe not feeling ready, we don't know, um, but they were being prepared for mission out in the world. And Jesus speaks of the harvest, but maybe a new metaphor is in order to bring home the truth of what Jesus is attempting to convey. Maybe a sports metaphor. This game is winnable, but the really good players are few. Therefore, ask the coach to send more good players onto the field. Or maybe another metaphor out of the familiarity of present-day urgencies. The burning house is salvageable, but the, available, the able firefighters are few. Therefore, ask the captain of the fire station to send out more firefighters into the fire. But one way or another, the message is clear. God, who called them, was ready to send them forth, for the harvest was plentiful, but the laborers were few. The needs were great, and the workers were few. All hands were needed for the missional tasks, so essential to the work of the Savior. And the same is true for the church today. There is plenty of work to do, and not a whole lot of people to do it. The needs are great. The workers are few. The world cries out for those who are willing and prepared to share the good news of the gospel. The good news that this is God's world, and in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, one day it will conform to God's will and to God's way. The mission of Jesus' followers is to continue the mission of Jesus himself. As disciples, we are to carry on Jesus' mission to his sheep. In today's lesson, he instructed his first disciples as to how they might proclaim the gospel through their words and deeds, which applies to modern-day disciples as well. American writer and theologian Frederick Buechner famously stated that Christian vocation is where one's deep gladness meets the world's deep hunger. In today's gospel, Jesus sent his disciples out, inviting them to fulfill their own vocation in the world by partnering with him in the work of healing and proclamation. For most of us, we do not receive a direct, audible call from God, as the disciples did, instructing us to follow a particular vocational path. Rather, we listen intently to the Spirit's work in our lives, seeking out wise friends who can help us discern the way. I've spent a good deal of time thinking about vocation the past four years, but discernment is not just for seminarians. We should all think about our vocation, what God calls us to do. What is your congregation's vocation, the place where its deep gladness meets the community's deep need? What does this community need to do in order to fulfill that vocational calling? Buchner also said that a good way to find your purpose, to know what, God, what mission God is calling you to, is the, to discern the work that you most need to do, that you most need to do, and what the world most needs to have done. He explains that if you enjoy your work, but it's meaningless, then you probably have not found your purpose. In Matthew's understanding, the disciples shared in Jesus' healing powers. As we stand to hear this gospel, Jesus is calling us who are now to proclaim the good news. The scope of Jesus' ministry and God's love is wide. It goes to all the cities and the villages. It cures every disease and sickness. The kingdom of heaven has come. The ministry is expansive. The word is for all. But it's not generic. 
Jesus said the kingdom of heaven has come near. It comes close and alongside. It does not show up as some fog that rolls into town, but arrives embodied in the people of God. That means we, as disciples of Jesus, need to get close and walk alongside those in need of God's love. It is our own call, our vocation as Christians. Sometimes God partners with us and sends us to further the kingdom of heaven in this world, to be bearers of the good news. Sometimes God partners with others and sends them to us so that we may be receivers of good news that we desperately need. And sometimes God partners with people and sends them into the midst of us too. The good news <coughs> is that the gospel will not be deterred. It goes out into the world to us, through us, and even around us if necessary. Despite our shortcomings and failings as humans, God will not give up hope for us to be a blessing to the world. The final section of our worship service is the sending. Along with the 12 disciples, we are blessed and dismissed in the peace of Christ to share the good news. We are commissioned as disciples to become Jesus' partners in the work of preaching the gospel, teaching, and healing. We have been called and equipped by the Spirit to do so. And no one ever said being a disciple was easy. However, in the very midst of a world which resists God, resists what God has to offer, those obedient to Jesus' mission are equipped and empowered with God's own presence. I am with you, even to the end of the age. Let us pray. Providing, Lord, you call, equip, and send your laborers into your fields ripe for harvest in various and amazing ways. Remind us often that your works and ways are our mission. Help us to hear your call in our lives, in our lives to love you and to serve our neighbors, proclaiming the gospel through our words and deeds. Amen. Rise in spirit for the hymn of the day.
Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for the world in need. For the church here and around the world, we pray. Seek out disciples and send them out with authority to proclaim good news, bring healing where there is pain, and counter the forces of evil. God, in your mercy. For the earth and all its creatures, we pray. Help us be humble stewards of your creation, that we might help restore lands ruined by pollution and misuse. God, in your mercy. For those who govern, we pray. Empower those who seek peaceful solutions to conflict and embolden those who advocate for all who are oppressed. God, in your mercy. For those who suffer, we pray, open their hearts to the healing power of your presence. We especially lift up today Judy, Muriel, Amy, David, Candy, Larry, Mary, Lynn and her parents, Marty and Sally, Sue and Dick. And those we name now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Along with his parents and grandparents, we celebrate and give thanks for the birth of Andrew James Whiting. We give thanks for those who willingly offered support to Steve and Candy, making it possible for them to attend a family wedding. God, in your mercy, for fathers and father figures, we pray. Console all who long to be fathers, children estranged from their fathers, anyone grieving the death of a father, and fathers who have lost a child. Draw near to all for whom this day stirs up difficult emotions. God, in your mercy. Brother in Christ, Marty Cope, we pray. Sustain him, strengthen him, fill his heart with the joy of your love that he shares with so many. We rejoice with him as he celebrates his 90th birthday, and we offer our thanks for the gift he is in our lives. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all the saints, we give thanks. Receive into your eternal care all those who have died, especially our fathers and grandfathers who have died, and those we name now aloud or in the silence of our heart. Fill us with hope that does not disappoint. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive our prayers and answer us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the risen Christ be with you always. And also with you. Greet our, our neighbors with a sign of peace.
of field and forest, sea and sky. You are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us, that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the choirs of angels, and with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
that we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you in his grace.
God's grace, we are called to act with justice, to love and serve one another, and to walk humbly with God. Go in peace, share the harvest. Thanks be to God.